I love the fact that I've got a husband that's willing to bring over this thing. I've got sons that are willing to do it. God is so faithful, so true. And I never take it for granted, folks, that God is good to me every day of my life. And uh, you've, many of you have been asking about my mom. She is doing good. And uh, God has been good to her as well. It's amazing to see... Um, how well she is for her age. And you know, the great thing is that when she went into the OR, all of the doctors, the surgeons were waiting for her to get there because they'd heard so much about her before she was ever brought down. Don't you want that to be your testimony at 96? I am blessed to be her daughter. And I believe that's the reason why I'm doing ministry today because mom put it in us that we're to love the Lord. We're to serve the Lord with all of our being. We're never to complain about him, but we're to give him all the praise and the honor. And so this morning, well, you seen Taffy was up leading worship. She's our new elder candidate. And so uh, she's also, um, you know, if you have any concerns, you can always come see me or the board, <laughs> Taffy. That doesn't always feel good when we're saying that, eh? But, you know, we give the audience three weeks, all of our members and stuff, that if there's any questions or anything they want to ask her, if you want to go to Taffy and just ask her a little bit about her life, you can do that as well. But she's going to be sharing on April the 27th at our women's tea, and she's going to come and share the women, uh, her heart with the women on um, basically, you know, just how God has gotten her this far but also about serving in the house of the Lord and what that means for us as women today. And I believe it's going to encourage you. You don't want to miss out. It's going to be a beautiful time. And so please, you got your cards, make, put that on your calendar, mark the date, and we'll all be there. Also this morning, we want you to be aware that, of course, of Israel, that we're praying for Israel. We're praying for everybody in that region because you know there are families, there's always innocence all over the place. And uh, Father only knows what people go through in times like this, but we are praying especially for Israel because um, in a couple of weeks' time, in three weeks' time, uh, Brother Kakish is coming from uh, Ramallah, and so he has an orphanage there in uh, Ramallah, and so he will be coming to share his heart. He's been through much. He wrote me a couple of weeks ago. He said, Beverly, pray that I get out. We need the refreshing. We need to be with saints that will pray for us. So on the Friday night, we will be actually praying for Israel. We're going to have a community Community prayer, other churches will be joining us. He will share, and then we'll be praying for Israel and for that region and for Ramallah and all the areas that he serves in. So mark that on your calendar as well. Well, this morning, the message is follow me. And so, folks, um, so often when I go before the Lord, I didn't get this message till later in the week. I was just saying, Lord, what do you want me to share on? But uh, Derek and I were traveling, we went to the Provincial Prayer Breakfast, um, MP, uh, our Minister Jean actually, and MLA uh, Tani Yao, they actually went and asked us if we would go, and we got a group of people to go down there with us, pastors and leaders, and it was powerful. There was about 700 people there, and it was beautiful. Um, Edward Graham, I think it's Billy Graham's great-grandson, spoke there, and what a powerful message he spoke. Very straightforward, very... Um, very crucial for this time in history and it was very I think everybody said wow what a morning we had together and I guess the fellowship too for us uh, you might have seen some of the pictures the mayor went we all went down we had a blessed time together and just in fellowship but when I got back I'm like Lord what do you want me to speak on so after the resurrection I was trying to uh, see what the people were doing. Like, what were the disciples actually doing after the resurrection? Where was Jesus showing up? And so as you read some of the scripture, it gives you an indication of what we're like as human beings, how we relate uh, in ways when we go through difficult times and what Jesus basically says to us. So after the disciples realized that Jesus was resurrected and they saw him again and they'd been through all the the talk about the grave being empty and all that, all of a sudden, the distractions are gone. They're back to normal life. And so, you know, they come to the, you know, the revelation, like, what are we going to do now? 
Where are we going to land with all of this? And so, you know, when we have encounters with God, when we have revelation from the Holy Spirit, it makes all the difference in the world and it springs forth hope. It was a new season for them again. It was a new day for them again. And Jesus shows up to his disciples at least three times after the resurrection. And in John 21, Jesus tells of the third, I mean, John tells of the third encounter with Jesus. And so we're going to read through a lot of scripture. And I just want to point out in the scripture this morning what uh, basically Jesus is trying to get across to you and I today. So in verse 1, John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel Kena in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now notice that Peter has still got a leadership mantle on him. He says, I'm going to go, and six follow him. How many know that even if you go through a rough time, God does not take off that mantle off of your life? It's still there. And it seems to, to me that Peter and the other disciples were uncertain about what to do, even though they had realized Jesus was resurrected, but they weren't sure what to do with their lives now. Were they going to go back to, um, like, what was the call now? So they went back to their previous occupation. They go fishing. They, I don't know if they're going to give up on ministry or they didn't know what the call was about anymore. It was hard to understand what it was all about or what was taking place. They were a little bit confused, I would think. And I mean, if Jesus only showed up three times, he was there for 40 days before he ascended. So what was he doing and what were they witnessing? What were they hearing? And sometimes we're like that. Remember when Jesus called his first disciples? It was in Matthew 4, 18, and I'm going to read that to you. Because he comes this time the exact same way as he came to them this day. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. So it was exactly the same way. He shows up while they're fishing and tells them what to do, and they obey, and then he makes them his disciples. Peter was the first person that he called. And so here he is again. Peter and them are out fishing, and he's about to show up again and say the exact same things to Peter. You know, one of the reasons why they left the first time was because he was a rabbi. And they were highly esteemed. They were, if, if he said, come follow me, you being a Jewish person, you would just leave what you were doing and follow. And that's the reason why they so easily went along with him the first time. But now they're on shore of that calling. Let's go to verse 4, 6 of John 21. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish. The exact same outcome. They caught nothing at first and were probably a bit disappointed now they're not sure what to be doing so they go back to their previous occupation they're fishing and then all of a sudden they're catching nothing like god what do you want us to do what are we supposed to do i'm sure in their hearts they were asking and like many of us do they didn't even recognize the scripture says Jesus. They didn't recognize his voice. They didn't know it was him. But they still obeyed him for some reason. And they cast their net on the right side of the boat. Probably the opposite of what they were doing. Why do you think they even obeyed? Do you think there was something inside of them maybe that went like, well, this is, sounds like a familiar voice. Or we've done this before when Jesus told us to. But they did not recognize him at this point. If you go to Luke's account of Jesus calling them, 
in, uh, is Luke 5.4. I'm going to read through that. I want to show you how when he came the first time is exactly the same way he comes again. He calls them to ministry, and then he comes back to reinstate them into ministry. So he does everything exactly the same. And the reason why he does that, folks, God, if, in your life, if you have ever noticed, I realize that God will take me around and around and around the mountain until I get it. Same lesson, right? He'll do the same things for you. So it says, when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, which was Peter, right? Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. You see the discouragement again? And haven't caught anything. Basically, you're asking us to go out now further and try to get fish, and we don't want to do it. But because you say so, because you, the teacher, said so, we will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they singled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. How many know with Jesus, he could give you over what you ask or think or imagine. I don't know if you experienced that in your life, but I have. Do you think that Jesus was reminding Peter and the others of the first time he met them? Was he trying to bring them back to their first love, to that call upon their life? But how quick we forget as human beings, and we're no different. You think the disciples would have recalled this time and said, this must be Jesus again because it's the exact same thing. No, they were caught up in their failure. Peter had just denied Jesus. Many of them were not their mind in spirit, and they were caught up in everything but. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where you failed? To rec you know, you're failing. Life is miserable. You don't recognize his voice. You don't know where he is in the storm. You can't figure out what he wants of you, and you are frustrated, and you are disappointed. Have you ever had those moments? I have. I'm sure we all have here, Right? God will test you, folks, to see if you recognize his voice. Do you understand that? It's more about that than anything. He's trying to test you. Because if you hear him in the simple things, when the storm and the winds are blowing all around you, when there's war in Israel and the news is saying it, they could hit the U.S. and on and on and on, when you know it in the small things, you will know it in the big things. You will know it in the storm of life. You will be able to distinguish his voice from all the others. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to need to know his voice today. The world is getting more uh, uncertain as we go, would you say so? You never know when you're going to turn on the news and there's something else that's happening. If you're watching online this morning, I know some from Ontario are watching me. Uh, I'm glad that you've tuned in. Please uh, stay tuned with us so you can hear this message from the Lord. It's so important to note that when Jesus tells us to do something, even if it doesn't make sense to us, you see, there in the morning in Israel, they told us when we went to Israel that you would fish at night when the water is cooler because the fish would come more to the surface. So you catch more fish. But here's Jesus in the morning when it's light, it's daytime, saying, no, go back, turn, put your net on the opposite side. You can imagine fishermen from Newfoundland, people that know Newfoundland fishing, and others here, I'm sure, from the uh, East Coast especially, that, you know, if you were out all night and you're casting out your nets and all that, and you didn't get nothing, thinking that you're going to throw it on the opposite side, it's not going to mean a whole lot to you. But when Jesus says it, there's something different. You see, when Jesus says do it, you need to obey. His instruction will bring about a miracle even if it doesn't make sense to you. That's why you need to know his voice. Jesus shows up and there's this miraculous catch of fish, enough probably to supply for all their families and they've got probably more left over. This was believed by most people that research the Bible to be signs of the ministry for Peter and them to come. They were going to do greater ministry when Jesus went back than what they did before. They were going to actually go out and lay hands on the sick themselves. All over the place they're going to recover, just like Jesus did, right? He had sent them out before he went to the cross, but now he was leaving it all in their hands. They were going to be in charge. They were going to be the leaders. They are going to be the ones that's actually going to witness the laying on of hands and, and things happening. How many believe today that God wants that for us? He wants you and I to go out and lay hands on the sick. He wants you and I to believe for miracles. He wants you and I to see his kingdom come today. They would do great things. Remember with the Holy Spirit working in your life, 
there's always more to come. And we diminish God, but you know, if you follow this risen Savior, if you get into his footsteps and you follow him by the inspiration and the voice of the Holy Spirit, you have no choice but to see God at work in your life. It's when we obey. Jesus commanded his men to fish for men to preach the gospel and make disciples. And now often you and I, just like Peter and them, when we go through a rough time or we have a busy week, we forget this particular thing that we've been called to. You see, I say over and over, if everybody in this church invited one person, you would have to get out of, you have two services before you could blink, then you would be building a new building and on and on it would go. So that tells me lots of times that we're not going out. And sometimes when we do preach the gospel, it's not the way Jesus would have done it. You see, we have to serve people. We have to wash people's feet. We have to love people at where they are. We have to get down on their level and be with them. You know, when I went down to the prayer breakfast, I was very amazed at Edward speaking. I was amazed at the premier. She, she said some great things. But you know what blesses my heart more than that? Is just being with our city leaders, you know, getting to talk to them, getting to love on them, to say, I pray for you. Two of them said to other leaders as they came and we were taking pictures and that, And this is not boastful, folks, but if we do what's right, God will make sure that our hearts get heard in somebody else's life, that they realize that they are loved by God. Two of them came and they said, Pastor Bev, you're the only person so often, not the only person, they get lots of encouragement, but I mean, I write to tell them that I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll hear God saying to me, write this one now and tell them this. Sometimes I'm like, God, is that going to make sense? Does that make, you know? But one of them was leaving me, and they came to hug me, and they said, you know what, Pastor Bev, please don't stop what you're doing for me. I feel so good when you're around me. I wonder what I'm doing if I'm doing a good job, but I feel so good when you send me a note or when you say you're praying for me, my spirits lift and I feel like I can do so much more. You know, folks, we can always point fingers, but oh, how many of us will take the time to go and wrap our arms around somebody that needs it, even when they're not doing right, but say, Jesus loves you. Jesus put you in that place. And that's the power of the resurrection story right? The miracle that happens time and time again if we preach this gospel, if we teach this gospel, if we serve people, if we love people, they will know that they are loved. You should expect more blessing as the Holy Spirit directs you, not less. The truth should go deeper in our hearts after the resurrection story. Every year when we watch it or we see it, we talk about it, we should get pumped to go again because Jesus asked Peter in the scriptures, he said, cast them out into the deep because the deep cries out onto the deep, folks. You cannot do surface fishing and expect a great catch. You need to go after people in a, in a loving way and tell them about the good news. Tell them your testimony. Your testimony is powerful. And I realize that because the world does not know what we know. When I'm with people, I say all the time, guys, don't be too hard on them. They don't understand that. It's like my mom. You know, mom says all the time, I don't know why the Lord don't take me. What in the world would he have me here for now? But who's going to witness to those surgeons? Who's going to speak to those nurses when they're yanking her up in the bed and the screams are coming out of her, but she never says a word to them? Who is going to witness to them, folks? And I employ all of us to be that, to pray for strength and courage so that you might be what God needs you to be in the hour, in your weakest moments, in your most troublesome times. It's where we have to have a testimony, not on the mountaintop. You see, when everything is going good and I'm telling you God is good, it doesn't really bear a lot of witness because, yeah, life is good right now. I've got money. I've got food on my table. But put me in the hospital bed with a broken hip. 
Put me somewhere where I get a diagnosis with cancer and then tell me how my response is going to affect you. And I'm telling you, I was a nurse for many years and not a lot of, I shouldn't say that, not a lot of Christians, but not always do Christians act properly when it gets down to the crucible of life. The disciples recognized Jesus on the shore after a while. They, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved in verse 7 and 8 said to Peter, it is the Lord. They finally caught on. This is the Lord. It was John. John was the one that Jesus loved, right? The one that laid his head on his chest at the Last Supper. Now, when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat. I often wonder if the wording in the Bible is there on purpose, the little boat. For they were not far from land, but about 200 cubics, dragging the net of fish. But Peter unabandonedly jumped out of the boat and start running towards shore. Don't you like that picture? It is the Lord. When was the last time in your life that you said, it is the Lord. I've heard his voice. I've seen him at work. It is the Lord. When's the last time you looked at your partner, your child and said, do you know that's God? Do you know that God did that? When was the last time you got excited and said that? I hope there's something in your life every day that you can say that. Oh, my little, Kelly's little girl, three years old, she came over and I've been having trouble with uh, one knee and stuff and she said, Nanny, are you feeling okay? Do you still have a bad knee? And I said, yeah, Nanny does, but it's okay, Nana's good. And she said, Daddy has one too. I said, yeah, Daddy has one too. I said, but guess what? I said, it doesn't matter if Nanny got bad knees. It doesn't matter if she's in the bed sick. Jesus still loves me. And Jesus is taking care of me, right, Jules? She said, yeah, Jesus loves us. Like that. Every moment is an opportunity to teach somebody about the love of Jesus. We could go, oh, yes, Nanny got a bad knee. Kiss it, kiss it. Oh, get down there and kiss it. Isn't that our response most of the time? Why? Because we want the attention. Come on, let's be truthful. And probably we've been sick. We need a little love and the care and attention. That's Derek's job, by the way. He's gone. See, I can say that now, right? See how I put that in there so nobody got out there? No, but you know what? We are blessed. I said to my sister this week on the phone, Cheryl, we are so blessed with husbands that love us with families that are around to support us and love us. Our words should be nothing but praise to God day in and day out. God has been good. If you believe that, yeah, give him a hand. God is good. It is the Lord. And during word commentary notes that John reached the tomb before Peter in John 24 and recognized the fact of Jesus' resurrection before Peter, here, John also recognized the identity of the stranger on the shore before Peter did. So why is it that John is not leading the church? Why was it Peter was called, upon this rock I will build my church? Peter was known as the shepherd, okay? John was known as the one that would witness Jesus Christ. And his whole book, if you go, we always tell new Christians, go to the book of John because it'll tell you about who Jesus was. But Peter was going to be the good shepherd. He's even going to die the same way that Jesus died, right? So Peter plunges into the sea. John was the first to recognize him. But most people that study the Bible believe that it was Peter's devotion to Jesus that was shown when he threw on his outer garment and jumped into the water to reach Jesus as soon as possible. Nothing could get him there fast enough. When was the last time you thought, I got to get to Jesus? When was the last time that your heart within you was so uh, palpable and, and beating within your chest saying, I've got to experience you, Lord. I've got to get to you. I've got to know you more. I've got to feel you today. I've got to hear your voice today. When was the last time that your heart beat within your chest like that? Because when it does, folks, Jesus will not deny you. He will show up. This week... I'm always very concerned about 
my actions before God. And so this week I had to write somebody and I was trying to encourage them. And uh, I wrote this long list of things that I believed would and wasn't sure how they would take it because you don't know through text and whatever. And then all of a sudden I thought, I better pray before I send that. I'll just pray, Lord. So I said, Derek, you pray with me. We prayed. And after I prayed, it was only minutes. I opened up my devotional. You know what it said? Just like this. Do not do that. They will be offended. They will not take it the way you thought. And it will only leave me less room to move. And I thought, there you go, erased it all, put my phone back down, thought, I'm done. You see, God just saved me from something. I don't know what it would have been. Maybe that person would have responded negatively. I thought that me being the shepherd, I had to take care of something. God said, get your hands off of it. You don't need to touch that. Let me work, and I will work it out for the good. When people are offended, they cannot do. You cannot make it happen, Beverly. How important it is to hear the voice of the Lord. The boat wasn't moving fast enough. Peter, although he had denied Jesus many times, but Peter was still the one that just never, you know, jumped out of that boat. He walked on the water. He was always trying to get to Jesus. He was extravagant in his movement towards Christ. And that's what we need to be, extravagant in our movement towards him. Don't back off when things are uncertain. Jump out of that boat, even though you're going to get wet and people are going to look at him like, what in the world is he jumping out of the boat? We're, we're not that far from shore. Couldn't he have waited to get there? Can you imagine the commentary? I know human beings enough to know that would have all been said. And look at him again. He's jumping out just like when he jumped out before and almost sank and drowned. That's what we're like, right? But you have to want God, folks. Your heart beating in your chest. We sang the song in the Easter play, my heart wants you. It wants you. It doesn't want all the other things. It wants you. This was Peter. That's why God could say to him again, get up, be raised up in Christ's name and go out again, Peter. You're going to succeed this time. You're going to actually lay down your life for me. In verses 9 to 14, I'm not going to read all of that because you see Jesus invites the disciples for breakfast. He's already on the shore. He's got the meal prepared, the fish, the fire's going. Don't it remind you of going home? I love it when I got off the plane in Newfoundland and they're like, oh, we got a pot of soup on. Oh, my bed buns on the counter. Right? You're going home. Jesus is there. They've been out fishing. They're disappointed. They're discouraged. But here's Jesus with the meal already ready for them to partake. But he's God, folks. He didn't have to cook them a meal. But he's still showing them this is the way. Serve people. It's not always about preaching. Serve people. Get down there and do what's necessary so somebody else might see that you love them. Then we see in verse 15 to 17. Here's where Jesus goes right to his heart. Jesus publicly here restores Peter. Okay? It reads, So when they had eaten breakfast... So they had a good time together. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he meant the other probably people, or I would, have, I would think. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things though. You know that I love you. Like basically, why are you asking me that again? He says to him, feed my sheep. Jesus came to restore Peter and to remind him of his calling. He's about to reinstate him. And here you see that through the questioning, through the asking, because he had just denied him three times, so talk is cheap when our actions are lousy. 
So Jesus is trying to get him out of the abundance of his heart to speak, to tell me, Peter, say it. I want you to say it. I want you to hear what you're saying. I want you to know that what you're committing to this time is going to be more than what you committed to the last time. You're going to have to be more mature. You're going to have to walk a harder road. You're going to have to go in before the Sanhedrin. You're going to have to speak up in there. They're going to, they could take your life right there. And one day, Peter, you don't know it. And he tells them here in a bit that you're going to go to the cross just the way I did. You're going to lay down your life for me. That must have, in his spirit, that must have been very hard to take. If I told you today that you were going to die for Christ... And you're going to die a horrible death. How would you take it? But you see, the more he asked Peter, the more Peter was resolute in his mind and in his heart. No, I do love you, Lord. No, I do love you, Lord. No, I do love you. He's not only running towards God, but he's convinced of his love for Jesus. And that convincing, folks, that stating it, our testimony is powerful. Our, I'm preaching. I try to get people to commit, to come forward, to do it. Because once we do these things, we don't shift back as easy. We're more mature in the gospel. We don't sway with every wind and doctrine. We become more steady on our feet. We land on the solid foundation, and we can walk it out in the roughest of days. That's not the church today. Let me tell you that. So many people are in trouble. There's so much in people's lives. I have people coming to tell me, Pastor Bev, this is what you do. While well, they got a ton of sin in their own lives, they can't get their own lives straightened out. They don't know what their own lives are about, but they will come in and tell somebody else how to preach it and live it. Take care of yourselves. And I'll get to that because basically that's what Jesus tells Peter. Peter is reinstated in 1890. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, Peter, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. You were a little bit more up and down. You did what you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands on that cross and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, Now, Peter, follow me. Now that you know all of that, that it won't be as easy as you think, now follow me. He was challenging him in his spirit and mind to say, Peter, this is serious this time. I want to build my church on you. Are you going to commit? Are you going to be up and down and around the bend and flimsy and there one minute, not there the next minute, emotionally up, emotionally down, in fear one minute, in faith the next? You see, our testimony, we all go through rough stuff. And God allows us to grow. When we're younger Christians, you will stumble a lot more. You will doubt a lot more. You will ask a lot more questions. You will fail a lot more. But when you get older in the faith, you'll be more steady you will know me and you will stand for things and you will be assured of my vo voice follow me these are the first words he said to Peter these are going to be the last words he says to Peter follow me he reinstated Peter even though Peter denied him can you imagine if you were dying and this has happened sometimes in marriage, and I'll say marriage because that's usually the closest person to you, and your partner just leaves you and never looks back. That was Jesus over and over with the people that he washed feet, washed their feet. He challenged them with the cross again. You see, when the cross was presented to Peter the first time, he didn't manage it well, did he? He's in hiding, he's denying. I don't even know if he ever come out and looked upon Jesus on the cross. He's nowhere to be seen. He failed when the cross was presented to him the first time. He ran, hid, denied. But this time, he's going to face the cross again, and he embraces it. That's how God matures us. That's the whole crux of this message, that God will get you there. 
when he needs to use you, if you stick with God, if you follow him, when you get to the time when he needs to use you, you will have strength and power upon your life to stand for the gospel. If it gets worse in the world today, if things get harder, folks, you're going to know to need God. You're going to know how to uh, basically trust God. And you're going to need to know him and have a need of him not be just doing your own thing. And you're going to need to be able to say in the very crux of all that's going on, I believe. I will follow him no matter what. But here's the great news. And Peter had just witnessed this as well. Because Peter realized, right? That Jesus come out of the grave. Maybe there's hope. And even if I die, I'll come back to life too. Don't you think he was thinking that? Of course he was. That's the reason why it wasn't so hard to bear. Jesus had already gone through and had come out victorious. Jesus was going to go on to be the heaven. So he knew there was victory in that cross. He knew there was power over death. So Lord, I can take it. Yeah, I can go through easier than the first time. But how human we are. Let me just say this because this is where we're going to assume bring the band back because we want to do communion. John 21:20. It's the last of this chapter. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. Now that was John again, the beloved, right? This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus' at supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? You're telling me about me, I'm going to die. But what about that guy? Jesus answered, you want to know his answer? If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. What are you caught up in somebody else's life for? What's going to happen to them? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. How often when we are challenged by God, how many times does God come to you and say, you need to be at prayer meeting. You need to be here. You need to be there. And you make the excuse, but what about the, I don't see Pastor So-and-so there. <laughs> Why do I have to go to church every Sunday? I know a Christian down the street. He don't go at all. At least I'm there once every four weeks. We do that all the time. We deflect everything off of us that God challenges us with and we start looking at everybody else out there and we try to say, but God, what about him instead of me? Don't get, the, get, the, you know, get your eyes off of me. What about him over there? Must Jesus, that's none of your business. That's what he's saying. Jesus could say it straight. Got nothing to do with you. If Sally makes it, she makes it. That's between me and Sally, not between you and Sally. We go home so often, we pick everything apart. We got everybody we start, and we go right down the line to the smallest thing that we didn't like, but you haven't lifted a finger to help. Now I'm being straightforward. Come on. What about you, he says. You follow me. Peter, you get your eyes. You do what I ask you to do. That's all you're going to give an account for when you get there. Stop worrying about everybody else. I'll take care of that. You see, your transformation requires cooperation with the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be transformed and used by God. You will not become the man, the woman that God wants you to be if you don't cooperate with God and get your eyes off everybody else. It's all about you. It always was me. He placed you here for such a time as this. He told you what was needed, and he's saying to you even today, what will you do for me? Will you follow me? Come on. We need to get this gospel straight, folks. We have power enough that when it roars inside of us, we could take the world. Stop thinking you're the only one that knows what the gospel is about. Jesus has many, 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 many people that know him, are serving him, and doing more than you're doing, more than I'm doing. God has got people all over this earth doing great ministry, and we start pointing fingers like we know it all. 
I warn you against that because when we get there, the way we judge, we will be judged and it's going to come against us. This is what he's saying here as well. We've got to be careful. Go out. You see, when I get the call, Pastor Bab, would you go to the prayer breakfast with us? It's my decision when I go. I can't worry what every other pastor is going to do, what every other leader is going to do. It matters that if God wants me there, that I'm seated at the table and I'm talking about the things of God and I'm praying for the people and I'm telling those politicians, look, I'm in your corner. I'm fighting that you will do the right thing. And if you don't, I'm also the person who wants to tell you because I love you too much to not see you succeed where you're located. And I do that, folks. I don't mind picking up the phone either way, but you gotta do it in love. You gotta do it in truth. You gotta do it because you really care about the kingdom and not about me. It's never about us. It will never be about us. It can never be about us because we take away the glory. And God wants you to glorify him today. Oh, he's asking Peter, do you love me? Oh, I love the fact that he jumped over the boat. I, I, when I'm praying, when I'm reading this stuff, eh? Derek be down watching Aki. He's at the back list to be preached. But when Derek went down, he said, I'll leave you alone for a bit. I'm up in the room and I'm like, God, let me be the first to jump out of the boat. I don't care if my two knees go right to the sand because I can't run. Lord, let me be the one that jumps out of the boat. Don't let me just preach it. Let me live it. Let me want it. Let me love you beyond human understanding. I want to love God. I want to love him with every breath I got in me. And if all of you, it doesn't matter. If he looked down here this morning, I pray, even with the angels, he could say, Jesus could look down and say, look at her. I called her. She's being faithful. She's, she's doing what I need her to do. And I pray that for you folks, that you will know that what God has called you to, you're doing, and you feel good about it. Because when you're in purpose, when you're in place, where God has landed you to be, you will be celebratory. You will be full of praise. You will be excited about your walk. You will go the distance. You will back up. You will move back. You will say, God, here am I. What next is on my assignment list? Stop worrying about. You know, God said to me not long ago, it's the truth. I told you uh, last week, Beverly, yeah, you can pray for hours. And sometimes I have to. And sometimes God calls us to those seasons, right? To intercede, to fast and pray. And I got to do all that. But this is what he said to me. I want you to get very certain in your mind what you need from me. I want you to ask quickly, straightforward. I want you to ask, believing in faith, not crying for hours thinking you gotta beg me for something. I am about my father's business. It's the last hour. Ask and you shall find. Seek and you're gonna find it, Beverly. I want you to be motivated. I want you to be on target. I want you to do and I want you to say what I need you to say. I want you to quickly move. I want you to quickly do what I ask you to do in season, out of season. I need fast movement. I need you jumping out of that boat. Moving in the direction I'm calling to. Not just still. Yes, prayer. We need those intercessors. I got lots in the church. I thank God for it. But I'm telling you, this is a season to go out there and to preach the gospel. We could be in the last hour. We need everybody on deck. We need everybody doing what we need to do. Oh, we get more worried about other people's sins and whether we have truly found Christ ourselves and whether we truly love him. And that's what I'm trying to get you to discover this morning, that to ask you the question, Ben, we'll ask you to come back. As we take communion, he was trying to get Peter to examine his own heart. God was trying to take him deeper. And he was trying to get him to confess. Confession is a powerful thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Watch what you speak. I've been saying to Derek and I lately, Derek, we shouldn't say that. That's not good. Did we just hear what we said? That was negative. That's not good. I'm not about all positive talking. I don't mean it like that. But I'm like, Derek, this is not good. We need to change our ways. We need to get in accordance with what God is doing. We need to speak life. We need to be victorious. We need to keep on moving towards what God is saying. We're going to see great miracles. We're going to see much happen. The first time Peter's voice was a voice of fear. The second time 
when he said, I love you, yes, I love you, yes, I love you, God, it was pronouncing faith in Jesus Christ and his devotion. And the question for us today is, we actually made up our mind that we love Jesus Christ. Paul, in Corinthians 11, 23, and through to 27, I'm going to go down to 27 first. He says, so whenever... So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many amongst you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. What does that mean? You're doing nothing, basically. But if we are more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would come, we would not come under judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So what's Paul saying about this? And some people asked me when Edwin did communion up there the other day at the Good Friday service, and what did he mean? And this is what I think he was saying. And this, again, you know, you research what a lot of commentary says, what people have studied the Bible says. Paul basically warns the Christians here to treat the Lord's Supper with reverence and to practice it every time in a spirit of self-examination. However, this is not written with the thought of excluding ourselves from the table because we all sin. We all have things in our life that's not good, Right? You could have sinned this morning by being upset with your husband before you even got here and never asked for forgiveness. I don't know, right? Maybe last night you said some things or done some things you shouldn't have done. We all have those moments. But Jesus is not saying you can't come to the table. He's just saying, look at those things, the things that you're doing there. You know, watch over your heart so that it doesn't become worse, that you're not entering into more sin, that we're not worthy of what God, Jesus did for us. He's not saying that. Jesus died to cover our sin. But he says, I want you to have the right heart, an honest appraisal of who you are when you come to the table of the Lord. We're to conduct ourselves in an honorable manner, right? And if there's things on our plate that's not good, this is an excellent time to say to the Lord, Lord, look, you know, I haven't had the best attitude this week. Sometimes we categorize sin and we think that sin is worse than this sin. No, sin is sin. And so today I would pray that you would do that a little bit, that you would, in your heart, you would take a moment. The idea is not to keep people ever away from the table of the Lord that have given their hearts to Christ, but to prepare them to take it in the right way. So this morning, I want you to just take a second. Just say a prayer and say, God, show me myself. Show me who I am and what I'm about. And Lord, would you today, Lord, if there's anything in my heart, anything in my life, like Peter, do I really love you, Lord? Would I die for you? To ask those questions. And be honest with yourself. And if you could say, no, I'm not ready for that, Pastor Bev. I don't know that much about God. Or I, there's no way I could lay down my life at this stage, I don't think. That's an honest appraisal, folks. And then we just ask God, God, help my heart to be strong. So if you ever require more of me, that I'll be there, that I would be able to do it. So is it just for a few seconds, just ask the Lord to check your heart, and I will do the same here this morning. We all sin, come short of the glory of God, including me some days, folks. Could you stand with me? You get your cup and your bread ready. If you're here today and you feel like you're not worthy, 
No, the blood of Jesus counts you worthy. If you've received him in your heart, you're worthy to receive the bread and the drink. Amen? God has covered your sins, folks. You don't have to go back and every day ask God to save you again. You're saved. He'll work on you. He'll do the, what's needed. But I know a lot of us some days feel like we're not the part. We haven't done it right, Lord. We're, we're not quite what we should be. But even with Peter, after all he did to Jesus, not being there, denying him, lying to the kid, doing all that he did, Jesus still came to him. Isn't that a beautiful story? And Jesus comes to us here this morning in this room. He's come to you and said, would you eat and drink with me? Would you know that I've still got a calling upon your life? Do you still know that I love you and I'm counting on you? He's not putting pressure on your shoulders, folks, to be more than what he called you to be. He's equipped you for whatever you need to be. He doesn't put on due pressure. God gives us rest. We come to his feet and he gives us rest. If you're not restful, if you don't sleep at night, come see me so I can pray that out of you. Because one of the signs of trusting God is a good night's sleep. Do you know that? Do not go through life thinking that God is not for you. He is so for you. He has a purpose for your life. Paul says this, for I see, received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul was saying, everything I'm telling you is what I'm receiving from the Lord. I'm just giving it to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take this this morning. If you're here this morning, you need to be reminded of the cross for you. Take it and just thank God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink it together. If today you need a healing in your body, if it's appropriate, put your hand where you need healing. Jesus died that we could be healed. If you're here, you don't know the Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer for you as well, but I want you today. If it's your heart that needs healing, if there's wounds and hurts, if your mind is troubled, put your hand on your mind. If there's some area of sickness in your body, just put, that, just put your hand there. Let's claim healing today together as the body of Christ, as the family of Jesus. Father God, we thank you today that you came. Oh God, are we excited that you came. Lord, and you brought healing. Healing is in, your, in the wings of all that's good, Lord. You soar over our souls and our minds today. And God, you bring healing to us. I pray for every troubled mind, for every wounded soul for every hurt person, Lord. I pray healing over them today, that they would know, God, that you love them, that you want to touch them, that you want to just bless them today. God, that you want to be with them. You want to give them those good night's sleeps. You want to make them a person that other people look to and go like, wow, wow, just like my mom, in pain or in sorrow. But I still love Jesus Christ. He's worth it with broken bones. He's worth it with wounded souls. He's worth it when we don't have money. He's worth it when we're troubled because he's still our source of life. God, touch every one here in the physical, Lord, that has a, needs a physical healing right now. I pray that the Spirit of God will swipe over this place, God, and you will lay your hand, Jesus, upon whoever needs it today. I pray, God, they will feel it right now. They will feel the touch of Jesus upon them right now, God. I pray, Lord, they will feel a difference in this place before they leave. God, we need to feel your touch. I pray everyone here, Lord, whatever is they have need of today, meet them where they are. Meet them where they are. If there are those that don't know the Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that don't know the Lord, could we just bow our heads for a minute? Could you quickly put up your hands so I can see that if you've never invited Jesus into your heart, could you lift up your hand real quick? Maybe everybody is here this morning. Just give you a minute. 
If you would like to say a prayer with me. I'm not seeing anybody from where I am, but it's hard sometimes to see all the hands. But let's just say this prayer together today. Father, we can all say this. We've sinned many times against you. But God, oh, come in like you did with Peter. Examine our hearts, Lord. Would you forgive us for our sins? God, would you come be Lord of our life? Would we let you sit on the throne of our hearts? Would we give you permission, Lord, to do what you need to do in our lives? But help us, Lord, to follow you, whatever that looks like. Give us strength and courage today to say yes to you, Lord. We invite you in. If you're online and you said that prayer, please just put in the commentary that you said it so we can reach out to you. God is here right now doing a work. You know, we sang some beautiful songs this morning. And there's so many nice ones. I'm not sure which one I... Well, I got to look at the list here, guys. Because I want to say something powerful that I wrote. And then I, or, you know, a few things of thoughts that I wrote down. And, and I want us to go back into prayer. Maybe if we start with ever be and then go into worthy of it all or even at Agnes Day, whichever you feel to do, Taffy. I'll leave that to you. Okay, if you're good, sing it for me. Yeah. They're going to sing My Heart Wants You from the Easter production. I just didn't think they could do it on short notice, but they're going to do that for us, right? Wow. So you're going to get ready for that because this is what we wanted to end with, that our heart wants Jesus. You want Jesus today? No, you don't sound loud enough for me. Does your heart want Jesus today? She's going to sing the most beautiful song, and then we'll go into a praise song, right? But this is a new day. Because of Jesus' resurrection, this is a new day. To concentrate, you see, when the, Jesus showed up, they now realized the mercy, the extreme mercy and grace that God had for them that they received from Christ that day, that they could take this liar, this, this denier, and make him again to be the head of the church. He was going to be the true shepherd of the new Christian church. You realize that with Peter, right? With God's help, the Holy Spirit, he was going to rise up and be what he needed to be. The gifts we're going to come. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and it's going to be more powerful than you ever thought. Wait for it, because there's something in the power of the Spirit that's going to illuminate Jesus Christ. It's going to bring you comfort. It's going to guide you, this person of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to empower you to go out and preach the gospel. Amen? You're going to have a greater power than you had even with me here. The Holy Spirit's going to replenish you. It's going to strengthen you for ministry. You're going to be like Elijah. He's going to give you the bread. You just ate from the table of the Lord, by the way. He gave Elijah bread that was supernatural bread that sustained him for 40 days. And he ran ahead of the chariots, folks. It was no ordinary bread. And he feeds you that every day if you want it. Are you running ahead of chariots? Come on. You see, you can run. You can. Even when you're wounded, even when you're limping, you can still jump out of that boat. Why? Because God is with you. That doesn't mean you won't have times of healing and times to rest and all of those things. But God, for this next leg of the journey, he's saying to Peter, you're going to rise up, Peter, and you're going to go in and have more power and more words in your mouth than you ever thought possible. I'm going to use you like you've never been used. And you will go on that cross upside down. And you're in the midst of that. You will be in terrible pain, but you're going to glorify me. Can you imagine? The disciples did not realize they were ordained and placed by God for kingdom duty. And you are today. You are placed for kingdom duty. If it's your portion to pray for the sick to be recovered, it's your portion to pray till the Holy Spirit comes, whatever it is. You're to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. And once, <laughs> once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, I can hardly get this out in English. You need to hold on for greater power. It's coming. It's coming, folks. You wait and see that if the church don't get more powerful. Many people let their temporary difficulties set them back. They let them discourage them, put them back down. And the people that talk sometimes the loudest are the weakest. And they say, oh, I, I, that wouldn't trouble me. Next week I'm getting a call saying, could you come? They're depressed. No, 
<laughs> I say this to you. Make up your mind in Christ. Say little, but act big. Know that you're about God. The Holy Spirit with you is far greater than any challenge that you could ever fast. Yes. face. Do you know that? Amen. That's true. And if we believe that, right, we can walk out into any circumstance and know that we can get through. Every decision, God will guide you if you wait upon him. Listen to his voice. Pray instead of complaining. Trust God for the outcome. God will take care of all your interactions. He'll order your steps. He'll show you the way. Seek God so you can navigate and the road ahead of you. Choose to be a blessing to those around you. You can face anything. Honor God with your words. Be victorious in your speech. Speak faith. Choose today to speak in faith so God can. Transformation requires your cooperation. It requires that you believe what the Word says. It's by faith. Now, a lot of you sympathetic folks, and I have those moments too. I go sometimes to people. I can't even get the words out. I just break down and cry because my heart just breaks for people. We have those moments. We need to pray for the sick, the weak. Just like Jesus, we need to feed them. But Jesus' message was always the same. Peter, do you love me? You're going to have terrible days, but you love me? Because if you do, if you love me, Peter, if you're convinced of your love for me, you can take the world by storm. Because it was my love, he said, for the Father. It was my determination to honor my Father. It was my revelation of the Father that made me get on that cross. I did it for you, but it was an agreement that him and I made in heaven, and I decided to honor my agreement. When we said yes to Jesus Christ, we say, here am I, Lord, send me. It might be hard. He'll come and feed us when we need it, just like Elijah, when you discourage. But he still, his answer is still the same. But Elijah, you got to get back up. Why? Because I'm not finished with using you. And Elijah, because he fed him supernatural bread, went out and did what he had to do and anointed Elisha to be so much greater than even him. And Elijah never seen death. I'm open. I'm open, folks, that I get resurrected. I, I, I pray that I'm lifted up. I pray I'm here when God comes. If I live to be under 20, like they say, God, I just joke. <laughs> That's what somebody prophesied. If I'm here, I hope I go up the sky. Just don't try to grab hold to me. I might be too weak. But I'm telling you, I'm going up that way. I don't know about you. Amen? So can you get excited? We're going to sing this. This is a little bit soulful. And then Taffy will go into something upbeat. i got to stay with you. I won't sing, but i gotta, I got to listen to that song. Let's, let's do it. Wake up in the dead of night with my heart calling yours, Jesus, Jesus. I lie wide awake in bed with my heart beating out of my chest, Jesus, Jesus.
stars I'm gazing at Jesus Jesus my heart wants you Ooh. my heart my heart wants you Ooh. today over the children of Israel. He's torn over the areas that are plagued with fear. If there was ever a time, folks, for us to pray, to be what we need to be, but to be very assured in what we're asking for. So God, this morning we ask for Israel. We say, God, protect your children. But here's the thing, God, they're all your children in the Middle East. You died for everyone. You died for every nation of people. You died, Lord, that we might have life, that we would not fight, that we would love one another. And human beings still don't get it. They still are fighting over territory and money and God of wealth and oil and whatever it is, God. But today we say, forgive them, God. God, I pray, protect your borders, Lord. Jesus, protect our pastors over there, our missionaries, God. The Christians that are there, Lord, that are not knowing what tomorrow will hold, but would you just, oh God, today, would you just go in there, God, with your presence and your mighty sending people, Lord, and may there be people there that will rise up to be words of wisdom, give governments wisdom, God. Jesus, we pray for the United States, God. Lord, we say, God, oh, forgive them for the times they've turned against you, against your ways, Lord. But God, this is the day that we need to pray for them. They need to be raised up again to be the people that you need them to be, God. Jesus, I pray for Canada as well. Reverse the things that are not of God, Lord. Change it around for the good, God. Cause, Jesus, a spirit of repentance to come upon our land. Cause, Lord, conviction. Pull, pull people in the darkness. Show them that is not the way. That is not your way. That's not what you wanted, God. Jesus, our children, we want them to live. We want them to succeed. We want them to be raised up in the fear and the admonition of God. We want them to serve you, Lord. We want them to know you so that they might live and surely not die. And so, God, today we just say pour out your spirit over the entire world, over the nations of this world. God, go in wherever there's a door open, God. Open up our hearts so that we might be used to pray, to intercede. God, to be a voice of wisdom, God, wherever we're needed. Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Do as only you can do. We can't do this work. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. I welcome you upon every life here. I say, fill them up, God. 
by your spirit. Let them know the mind of Christ. Let them know the heart of Christ. Let them know the mind of Christ today that they might be raised up to be an exceptional people in your sight, God. Jesus, may we be the army. We're not waiting for somebody else. May we, MGA, be an army of people that believe, that will stand on guard for Canada, that will fight for the nations, that will pray and seek your face till we know that you, your kingdom will come. But most of all, God, that we'll be a people of action. Jesus, you said go. You didn't say stay. You said go. Go and make disciples. Go and do my work. Be the church. So God, I just claim that for today. So look at me, people. One of the reasons why I go on a victory note every time is because that cross was victorious. I, nobody is going to take it away from me. I don't care if I'm in a sick body. I don't care what goes on. But you will not give me a defeatist spirit. You will not pull me back into the muck and mire where I was when I wasn't a Christian. I am saved and sanctified. And no matter how much I mess up, God is still with me. He's still guiding me. He's still changing me. He's still maneuvering me. He's still using me. And there's greater things to come. Amen. And I say to you today, you got sin in your life. You canceled it out. You ask for forgiveness and move move on into success move on into victory because it's the devil that keeps us back there wanting us not to be productive but this day this day is a new day just like it was for the disciples jump out of the boat and say Jesus here am I I'm going to go for it I will see your kingdom come I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover I will pray and you will answer my prayer you will incline Lord because that's the promise of the book I will not see this grave, but I'm going to come back out of it one way or the other. I, death cannot hold me down. Life is my portion, so I would claim an obedience, Lord, for my life, but I claim abundance as well. So if you have not had that abundance in your life, you don't know what that looks like. you got to go for it. Amen? And I say in Jesus' name, I cancel out every negative spirit in this place. I cancel out every spirit that comes against what God wants to do. I come against every spirit that prevents healing to this place. I come against every spirit, Lord. And I pray that we'll take our eyes of other people and say, God, here am I. Use me. Take me today. Use me today, God. Do not let me sit complacent, but move in the power and the might of God. So can you sing it like that now? If I can preach it, you can sing it, right? You can dance. Come on. Come out on a note. You bless the Lord this morning. Bless the Lord with all of his ways. Give him credit. Give him glory. Praise in the valley. Come on. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. I'll praise when surrounded. My praise is the water. My enemies drowning. Come on. As long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to pray. Cause my praise is a weapon It's more than a sound My praise is a shout That brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing I got a reason to praise The Lord on my soul 
I'll praise cause you're sovereign Praise cause you reign I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful I'll praise cause you're true I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you I'll praise cause you're sovereign I'll praise cause you reign I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful I'll praise cause you're true I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you Thank you, then, Brother Kakish. Lots to look forward to. Bless you today. Woo!